So this is the word of the Lord from 2 Chronicles 15. The spirit came upon Azariah, son of Oded. He went out to meet Asa and said to him, Listen to me, Asa and all of Judah and Benjamin. The Lord is with you when you are with him. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will forsake you. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach and without the law. But in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him. And he was found by them. In those days, it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the land were in great turmoil. One nation was being crushed by another, and one city by another, because God was troubling them with every kind of distress. But as for you, be strong and do not give up, for your work will be rewarded. When Asa heard these words and the prophecy of Azariah, son of Oded the prophet, he took courage. He removed the detestable idols from the whole land of Judah and Benjamin and from the towns he had captured in the hills of Ephraim. He repaired the altar of the Lord that was in front of the portico of the Lord's temple. Then he assembled all Judah and Benjamin and the people from Ephraim, Manasseh, and Simeon who had settled among them. For large numbers had come over from Israel when they saw that the Lord, their God, was with him. They assembled at Jerusalem in the third month of the 15th year of Asa's reign. At that time they sacrificed to the Lord 700 head of cattle and 7,000 sheep and goats from the plunder they had brought back. They entered into a covenant to seek the Lord, the God of their fathers, with all their heart and soul. All who would not seek the Lord, the God of Israel, were to be put to death, whether small or great, man or woman. They took an oath to the Lord with a loud acclamation, with shouting and with trumpets and horns. And all Judah rejoiced about the oath because he had sworn it wholeheartedly. They sought the Lord eagerly, and he was found by them. So the Lord gave them rest on every side. King Asa also deposed his grandmother Makkah from her position as queen mother because she had made a repulsive Asherah pole. Asa cut the, Asa cut the pole down, broke it up, and burnt it in the Kidron Valley. Although he did not remove the high places from Israel, Asa's heart was fully committed to the Lord all of his life. He brought into the temple of God the silver and the gold and ar articles that he and his father had dedicated. There was no more war until the 35th year of King Asa's reign. Amen. So that is the middle part of the story of King Asa. This is a map of the divided kingdom of uh, Israel. And as you can see here, there is a, a large area of Judah that is controlled by Judah. This happened in the time of Solomon, but what happened in the previous chapters to this chapter is some Cushites came south out of Egypt. Cushites actually are from a modern day Ethiopia or Sudan. And they came south to try to control this area, which was really important for trade and quite lucrative if you controlled those roads. So they wanted to come north and control the land of Judah. But King Asa had gone south and defeated them really by the hand of the Lord, by trusting in his God. And so he comes into this chapter, so to speak, with a lot of leadership equity. He has a, got a lot of respect. He's just defeated a major, major army from the south. Uh, I think it says a thousand thousands, a million. A lot of people, probably not that many, but a thousand units of something. A huge army has come up from, uh, from uh, Africa, from Egypt, and tried to defeat him. But he had totally run them out. And it's into this context that the prophet comes to him and says, be strong. So he comes into this chapter with a lot of equity. Now this morning we're going to talk about satisfaction. This is, I think, the third series, third sermon in a series on get wisdom or go beyond the gold that we started with from the gems theory, from the gems Sunday. The gems have been talking about how we're supposed to go beyond looking for material possessions and get wisdom itself, right? And we first talked about finding Jesus, then we talked about giving God first, and this week we're going to talk about satisfaction in our lives. To get started in this whole satisfaction discussion, I'd like to uh, play a song with these guys. Anybody know who these are? No. Rolling, Rolling Stones, right? Keith Richards, uh, Mick Jagger, right? I don't know why I couldn't think of that. Anyway, um, so this is the Rolling Stones. This is a picture of them back in the 60s. And um, my clicker just stopped working. Why don't you press forward it there, uh, there Mike? This is the Rolling Stones. And, um, oh, I know why. He's going to play the song Satisfaction. Maybe probably not for that. 
It's kind of like, ugh, it doesn't feel right in church, does it? Because it's such a thing from the 60s where these people were trying to seek satisfaction in consumerism, in everything that went with the hippie movement. But he, interestingly, is saying, I'm trying and I'm trying and I'm trying and I just can't get any satisfaction at all. He's trying. That song, incidentally, was rated by Rolling Stones as the number two most influential song in rock. It really struck a chord with people in America, in London, really the world over, because people know that all you try and you try and you try, it's really hard to get satisfaction. In the text here this morning, well, I'll start with our culture. Ray Bakke is a guy who did the, uh, has done a lot of work about cities. He's really analyzed cities, and he points out how in Western Europe and really all over the world, cultures used to be arranged around the church, right? The church was the biggest structure in these villages and these towns in Western Europe, and even in the small villages and other places, the religious expression of that community had a huge influence in that community, whether it was African villages and the, the healer, the native healer on the outskirts of town, or whether it was Western culture where they had this church as the main structure. So this is a picture of our church. It's uh, incidentally on all our social websites, if you're into that sort of thing. And um, anybody check in on Foursquare here this morning? Anybody know what I'm talking about? You do that? A couple people. All right. Anyway, uh, but regardless of what we do on social media, regardless of how we do uh, life together as a church, Ray Bakke points out that the churches are no longer the center of our culture. There's lots of other places. And so as I drove around this week looking at uh, our city here in Wyoming and Granville, there is a lot of churches in this area. So I'm not sure if our churches have been replaced, but there's definitely another place where we can go to worship, so to speak. Ray Bakke says specifically there's other temples that are available. Here's one. Rivertown Crossings. Great place to go and try to find satisfaction. You say, I don't know if I'm with you. I don't know if this is really a temple. Take a look at this. That's a dome on the entrance. These domes are first used by the Romans for public places and for temples. They're not trying to make a temple. They're not trying to get us to worship, but they are trying to get us to buy their stuff. Incidentally, when I walked in the, uh, in the uh, mall there, the first thing that happened when I walked through the doors is a security guy came up to me and says, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? He says, you're taking pictures. I said, yeah. He says, you're not allowed to take pictures in here. Because if we, uh, they just don't want to be represented. I was about misrepresented. I was about ready to take a picture of a store called uh, Love Culture. And I just thought it typified this whole thing of where we love culture and we try to get satisfaction in the things of this world. I talked to the mall manager, who was actually very nice, and he let me take this picture, um, and a few others, but this is the one I'll use, and this is just basically a gathering place. Now, we don't want to vilify the mall, just like the manager of the mall said, you know, please don't vilify the mall. This is a place to go and shop. I buy stuff there, you probably buy stuff there. But it's up to us in our lives to figure out if we're going to find our satisfaction there or elsewhere. And the fact of the matter is, as you sit in the mall and look at people, there's a lot of people who seem to be very focused on finding their satisfaction in that kind of lifestyle. All the clothes, all the makeup, all the handbags, all the shoes. It's an entire lifestyle, and people are doing their level best to try to find satisfaction, really to try to worship at that place. Think about that for a while. I didn't quite agree with Ray Bakke at that point when I first read it, but I kind of do now, that people are actually trying to find satisfaction, ultimate satisfaction, in that place. Here's another place. I like this place. Anybody like office supplies? I love office supplies. It's just kind of fun, right? I don't buy a lot of stuff there because it's expensive. Um, Art Van Furniture, they would love to have you take a couch home and pay them tithes and offerings every month. They would love that, right? And they're not trying to get you to worship. They're just trying to get you to buy a chair because that's good business practices. But they would love us to take lots and lots of furniture home and pay them a certain amount per month. And if we default after a year, then you pay all that interest. You know, this is just common business practices. But people can either try to find their satisfaction there or elsewhere. We can either try to find ultimate satisfaction in these shopping places or elsewhere. There's one more. This is Cabela's that's being built right now. This literally is Harold 
as what? A Mecca, right? It's a destination. It's a place where you go to see what's available, to go, oh, wow, this is great. And hopefully, maybe as you go there to try to find some satisfaction at things that are available at Cabela's. By the way, I love Cabela's. But the point is, am I worshiping there or not? So what happens when we, like the Rolling Stones, like Mick Jagger, Keith Richards, or whoever um, in this world tries to seek their own satisfaction? Well, back in the text, we have a description of a time where things were not great in the land of Israel. And it's talking about the time of the judges, when things were completely chaotic. And this is a phrase that gets repeated often in that time. And it says this, In those days, there was no king, and everybody did what was right in his and presumably her own eyes. That's what happens when you try to seek your own satisfaction. Everybody does what's right in their own eyes. People say that it takes 10 to 15% of a population to not care at all about the laws, to completely disregard the laws, for, for a culture to sink into complete anarchy. It only takes 10%. If 10% of the people try to ignore the laws completely, pull out their guns, go rob people, go steal, whatever, culture, that area, completely goes into anarchy. It's chaos. This passage says that everybody did what was right in their own eyes. This is the results that talks about in 1 Chronicles 15. The land itself, not just the people, the entire land was in turmoil. And it simply wasn't safe to even travel about. And of course you have this in areas where everybody does what's right in its own eyes. It's not safe to go outside. It's not safe to go out of your house because you might get, you won't get shot back then, but you might get a knife. You might get beat up. You might get yourself stolen. Nowadays, if this is like this, you'll get shot. The land is completely in turmoil and it's simply not safe. This is what happens when everybody in a culture decides to do what's right in their own eyes to the extreme. So chaos ultimately is brought about by the self-centered actions themselves. We know that. And this text says some interesting stuff. It says in verse 2 that God forsakes them and withdraws his presence. It says if you seek him, he'll be found. If you forsake him, not only are the actions causing chaos, it simply says that God withdraws his presence. He's gone. And the implication is that when God is gone, chaos ensues. And then there's this line. God troubles them. God troubled them with every kind of distress on every side. So this is a fascinating contrast for me because it says that if we do evil and step away from God, on the one hand, God forsakes us. But on the other hand, he takes a little stick, so to speak, or his finger and starts messing with lives. He's like, you know, I'm going to forsake you and not give you a blessing, but I'm also going to start messing with you. And why does he mess with us? Why does he mess with these Israelites back in the day? It's because he wants them to move back into a relationship with him. He forsakes us, but yet he doesn't forsake us. And this is a tension in scripture that we even heard in these original, these first readings that we read in, in the first part of the service. He departs, but he doesn't depart. He continually wants us to draw us into a relationship with him because this is, in fact, how he created us to live. So, you've been noticing this, uh, this fence up here? And uh, some of you asked, is there a dangerous thing, maybe something falling? But no, this is an illustration. But it's not actually an illustration of needing to stay out. It's an illustration of needing to stay in. The Bible says that no temptation has caused us, has tempted us, has seized you, except that which is common to humanity. So it's like we're born inside a protective fence. Now some of us are born in a better protective fence than others because our parents taught us that there is a fence and that there is things that we should not do, that we should not um, sort of break the Ten Commandments so we know, okay, I shouldn't steal, I shouldn't lie, I should honor my mother and father, I shouldn't take the name of God in vain, I shouldn't covet. We know these things because our parents taught them to us. Others of us grew up in families where we weren't taught this and honestly, Maybe until recently, we didn't even know there was a fence. And I know people like this, like, what, I'm not supposed to do that? They don't know. They've never legitimately been taught that there is a fence. It's like they're colorblind. They're like, oh, I don't see no fence. And they just do whatever seems right to their own eyes. It may be good things, it may be bad things, but more often than not, there's bad things that are included. The Bible says that no temptation has seized each one of us except that which is common to everybody. The point is, we're all tempted. The point is, even though we know there's commandments and we know that we should live with them, we are all tempted to go outside of them. And some of us, 
for whatever reason, or really all of us, at some point just, you know, oh, you know, my parents tell me I shouldn't do this, but I can see it. I mean, I can see through it. So we figure out ways to sort of step over the fence. And we're like, oh, it fell down. Okay. But it kind of works over here. Maybe we don't get beat up too bad, and we don't get beat up too bad originally. But then over here, maybe we get beat up more, and we go, okay, I need to get back in here. And we try to get back in. Okay, that's good for now. But then we think, oh, I don't know, you know, I'm going to try it again. And we think, well, you know, this particular law isn't that convenient. So maybe, you know, maybe I'll just take a look at what's supposed to going on over there. I'll just cut a nice little convenient hole that I can look out of because, you know, that looks really good. So look, I can see. And then maybe, uh, you know, that's good and it gets a grip on us and we cut a bigger hole. And I go, oh, yeah, this is nice. I mean, I mean, no one in church is saying anything. My parents don't know. I'm just going to, look at that. I mean, it's not that big, right? There's still all this fence over here. I mean, it's, it's pretty good, except that it's falling on my head. But, you know, I can see pretty good. It's all right. And then I go over here, and there's no hole there. Some of us start with that, and one temptation leads to another. And pretty soon, we think, oh, this step over here, and then this comes down like that, and then, and then that falls down by accident. And some of us really uh, kind of get deep in the weeds, and we think, oh, I'll put this over here. Oh, that's much more convenient. And I can't have that rule laying around and troubling my conscience, so I'll just kick it over there. Oh, yeah. Now I can have some fun. This is going to be great. I love it. But my parents don't know, it won't hurt me, right? What my people, uh, maybe the people I know, don't know, will be good for me too. And maybe I can find some friends that, you know, this works pretty good. And the funny thing is about the Israelites, they constantly had part of their fence up. They believed in God. But they also did a lot of things that they weren't supposed to. And that's when they started to get troubled by God himself. Turn this around here. But the beautiful thing is that if we get tempted in small ways or big ways, God always provides a way out for us when we're first initially tempted. When we first get tempted to do something, there's always a conscience, always a spirit that says to us, that probably isn't a good idea. Now, if we get wrapped up in serious, serious addiction, it's going to be really hard to say no to whatever we're being tempted to do because it's a lifestyle, it's a habit. But the beautiful part of this passage is that even when we're thoroughly mixed up in some dreadful addiction or some dreadful way of trying to find satisfaction in ourselves, still God comes to us and still he provides a way out. This week I heard some wonderful testimonies of people who were so far gone. One of them, Wednesday night, a guy came and I just said, so are, are you a Christian? And he says, yeah, I totally believe. What happened was this. About 20 years ago, I uh, was robbing banks. You know, I had the gun and everything. I was just basically a gangster. I robbed banks. And uh, I robbed a bank up here, went down to Indiana. And then my brother called me and said to me, he says, this is what happened. Um, the bank teller that you robbed is praying for you and their whole church is praying for you. And that guy, in the midst of his hurt, in the midst of his confusion, in the midst of his anger, had never seen love like that. He could not comprehend there was love like that in this world. And it changed him. And the Spirit of God used that to minister to him. And he cried and he cried out to God and he gave his life to God. Came back up here a couple days later. He said, you know, what God would you have me to do? And, and God said to his spirit, turn yourself in and tell the people in prison about Jesus. And that's exactly what he did. And that's 20 years ago. He was in prison for nine years. And he was here on Wednesday night. And just happened to share that story with me because I asked for a story. So even when they're in the midst of deep, dark addictions, seeking their own satisfaction, still God can provide a way out of that. In the passage, whether we're in the midst of deep sin or whether we're seeking to seek him more, the spirit comes. And that's the beautiful part of this passage, I think. He sends the prophet Azariah and brings a message of encouragement. Asa had been trying to seek God for 15 years. He has a lot of equity behind him. And in this context, the Spirit comes to confirm what's in Asa's own heart. He says, be strong and do not give up, for I will reward your work. Asa's not caught up in sin, but he wants to do more. And into that message, the Spirit, into that context, the Spirit comes. And then they began to seek him with specific 
costly actions. The fact is, if we're caught in the midst of sin, or if we're living a pretty good life, but we're prompted to do something more, often when the Spirit comes, it prompts us to do specific, very costly, somewhat difficult actions. And this is what happened with Asa. This is what he was called to do. He sacrificed a lot of cattle and sheep. They entered into a covenant. He gathered everybody together. He destroyed some of the altars, which people would have been very involved with. He deposed his grandmother, Makah. That is not easy to depose your grandmother from being the queen mother for putting up an Asherah bowl. He brought up the silver and the gold that his father and him had dedicated, and he brought that into the temple to actually be used by the priests. He did a lot of very specific, costly actions. Because the Spirit of God had come to him. Now our reality, you know, we're not king, but we are living lives and we do want to seek Jesus. So our reality is this. I think we need encouragement and that's why we come here. We need encouragement to seek him. We need the Spirit of God to seek him. And that's what I want to do a little bit this morning. As I stand up here, I mean I need this sermon as much as anybody. I need to be encouraged as much as anybody. I don't stand up here because I am perfect. I don't stand up here because I know everything. I stand up here because God has placed me here not as someone necessarily to follow me, but to follow Jesus. And so I want to ask these questions in a spirit of humility even as I listen to them myself. On the level of satisfaction, I want to ask this. If you're pursuing lots of money, is that really making you happy? Does taking that exquisite vacation once a year truly bring you satisfaction? Does going out to eat quite a few times a week, even though you probably don't need to, does it fill you up spiritually? Does that big screen TV make you come alive? Or does it just make the thing you're watching come alive? Do those fancy cars, fancy clothes, fancy jewelry, fancy house, fancy whatever you like, does that really make you feel better on the inside? Or does that just make you feel better about the way people feel about you? If we have addictive behaviors, do those addictive behaviors deal with the root cause of the pain inside? Or do they just smooth it over for a little bit longer for that day, for that week, and then that pain comes back? For those of you that are younger, does that new toy, does that new hobby, does that new fun thing, does that sports, do those extracurricular activities really fill your life up or do they just stretch you really, really thin? Ask the question. Does it really bring you joy to sit in front of the TV that much or to watch that many movies or to do whatever you find satisfaction in that's not ultimate satisfaction in Jesus Christ? There is a place for entertainment. There is a place for finding rest. But the question that I cannot answer for you is where do you truly seek satisfaction? See, I can't get into each one of your spirits. Only the spirit can do that. I can't do that. But I think as you ask yourselves, now am I seeking true satisfaction in this? Or am I seeking true satisfaction in God? That's the important question to ask this morning. So is the spirit speaking through dissatisfaction? There's a story of Israel and they're all over the place doing all sorts of crazy addictive behaviors and God is troubling them. Is there trouble in your life at this point where you're thinking this might not be just the trouble, the fallen world type of trouble. Maybe this is because God's trying to get my attention. There is suffering in the world to be sure. That's not a result of our unfaithfulness. But is God trying to speak through your dissatisfaction, trying to get you closer to him? And if he is, would you listen? Perhaps something's building in you like King Asa. Perhaps you have this holy dissatisfaction where life is pretty good. Where you are following him and even if you may have pain, you know it's because you're not, it's not because you're not being faithful. It's because the suffering in the world. But God is prompting you to be something more than you currently are. I think God is prompting our church to be something more than we currently are. God is prompting us to be a witness in this neighborhood, to seek him. To seek his face so that people could come here and meet Jesus Christ. Not just meet us, but meet Jesus Christ. And so if this sense of holy dissatisfaction is in your heart, maybe God can use it for you to come to him and say, God, fill me up. Help me to be something more 
than I currently am. Speak to me, that I may speak. Let me seek you, and let me be found by you. This passage, I keep coming back to. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Our temptation as human beings is to continually seek our own satisfaction. But God says again and again throughout Scripture, if you seek me first, then you will find blessing. If you seek your self first and your own satisfaction first, you'll just find frustration. Ultimately, the Rolling Stones never did find complete satisfaction because they didn't know Jesus Christ. They found a lot of money. But they keep hopping from thing to thing. I guess they're back on tour now. They're older. They're probably a bit wiser. But they don't know about Jesus. They can't tell people about Jesus. They don't know about ultimate satisfaction. So they keep trying and trying and trying. And really our whole culture keeps trying and trying to find satisfaction in things that will never fully satisfy. St. Augustine, who tried a lot of things, said this. Our heart is restless, O God, until it finds it's rest in you. And he knew that from personal experience that our heart is restless. We keep seeking to fill that God-shaped hole in our heart until we find our rest in you. So I want to invite us this morning, if you feel led, to take a seeking him step. The visitor cards that are in front of you, on the back of them, there's a prayer card. And if you feel prompted, whether it's by the sermon or whether something was building in your heart in the first place, I'd invite you to take one of these steps. Some of us are going through a lot of difficulty right now, and it probably isn't because we've stepped away from God. It's probably more just because of the nature of the world. But if you'd like strength to simply stand your ground, to be faithful in the midst of a very difficult circumstance, I'd invite you to fill out one of those prayer cards. And if you'd like to, you can bring it right down here to the offering plate that now has a little bit of water in it. But you're welcome to do that. Just bring it right on down during this next song. If you're thinking, well, maybe I am getting troubled because I've stepped away from God. I've stepped outside of his boundaries and sort of ignored them. Maybe I didn't know about them. Maybe I did. But I want to get back. I want to live in his boundaries. And I need help getting there. Fill out a prayer card and ask for help and bring it down. If you have a sense of holy dissatisfaction, that you want something more, and you may not even know what it is. You may want more righteousness. You want to be able to use more. You want to do more stuff that God has called you to do. I'd invite you to fill one out too. Last week we talked about giving God first of our financial resources. This week we're really talking about giving God our entire lives. He has in fact given us everything. And when we give him our all, our everything, he doesn't sort of take our life and put it to the side and says, oh, okay, I got that. He gives it to us back. And he gives us his full life back in our full life in return. So I invite you during this next song to sing this as a covenant vow to him. And if you'd like to fill out one of those things, you can bring it right down and put it in here. We're also going to have prayer servants available. And there'll be a, a couple there and a couple there. And I think uh, Doug and Cindy, are you still willing to go to the back and pray for people at the back? Um, so you can either bring that stuff forward here, receive prayer, or uh, just stay where you are and use this next song as a covenant agreement to seek God and to serve him. Amen. Amen.